perfect way to begin. Greetings, Bob and Melanie. How are you today? Very good, Lindsay. Thanks so much for having us here. So good to see you. This is a special treat because unlike most of um, the Shift Series interviews, we are actually local to one another and we are in community. So it feels especially um, heart-filling to know that we get to weave in our online worlds as well. Absolutely. Um, so I want to introduce you to the audience of the Shift Series. Bob and Melanie are... Um, are friends, they are guides, they are leaders in our community, they are healers in our community. Um, I first became acquainted with them as individuals and as friends through my friend Marie McCree, who has been a mentor with um, the Mystic Society. But I also um, had the good fortune to be able to call on you when my son was sick after a trip to Paris. And we'd had repeated trips to the ER and were feeling very lost about how to um, help him find his way back into healing. And that was the first time I got to experience a healing session with you. I had experienced some of your Diamond Way Ayurvedic sprays and products. Um, but your approach to helping um, facilitate the body finding its own way back to balance and back to healing was unique and refreshing. And not only did it resonate for me, but I was astounded how much it resonated for my children. They still talk about that experience. Cricket still asks to come see you too. So um, I'm just really honored to have you here today. And um, I would love to just hand it over to you for a moment to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your story, how you came in to be doing the work that you're doing in the world. Well, I, I guess we could say that that um, both of us have always been interested in health and healing. Um, Melanie started off initially going into the area of occupational therapy, and I was training as a mental health counselor. We actually met at a, uh, a long-term psychiatric hospital in England, and a lot of what it was was that she was training, I was training, and we were looking at, at that point, uh, what we considered to be a really draconian and even though it was quote-unquote quote, modern, very outmoded way of thinking about the mind and about mental health. And what it did was it sort of prompted us to, I mean, at that point I was doing yoga already. I was already involved with meditation. But we really began to look and search for those things which really support rather than uh, quote-unquote uh, mask the symptoms of, of, of illness. I, I would say um, it really came out of the inquiry, what the hell are we doing studying medicine yeah. Yeah. that cannot explain to us the causes for the problem in the first place. Yes. And that just, you know, I can remember the day when I sat in class and that penny dropped for me and it's like, you know, this is some kind of madness here. We, we're taught, we're being taught uh, surgical procedures, we're being taught about drugs and medicines, we're talking about therapeutic, we're being taught therapeutic approaches that basically are anecdotal stabs in the dark for how to deal with problems because we, we cannot tell you why these things arise and why different conditions arise for different people. You know, given you know, take a group of six people, expose them to, a, you know, the same kinds of things, and guaranteed those six bodies will respond differently. Well, how can, how can we explain that? You're, you're touching on the foundation for how both chronic wellness tools and full circle wellness tools were born because my family was touched with Lyme disease and co-infections and these chronic viruses and these chronic infections, and every single one of us had a different presentation of that almost exact same lab work, looked the same on paper and yet completely different manifestation in the body and left me completely stumped as a parent and caregiver for how I was supposed to proceed with a single one one treatment fits all approach when we were experiencing it completely differently. The littlest one with one symptom and the middle with another and me with a you know completely neurological presentation. So yeah, you're you're touching on that thing that we're we're so stuck in today, which is this diagnosis equals treatment, whether or not we understand why it's coming into being in the first place. And then where does that leave us as we just stack layer and layer and layer of more pathology and stress on top of it? So how did that inquiry lead you into the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, that was, that was 40 years ago. Uh, and really what it is is that um, from the process of doing uh, yoga, from the process of looking at meditation, 
uh, from looking at mental health, we began to look more and more into diet, uh, more and more factors around diet, uh, more with respect to, to body work began to see. And really in Ayurveda, about 90% of the work of Ayurveda, I mean, everybody thinks when they think Ayurveda, they think of really exotic herbs, but really 90% of what Ayurveda offers is common sense approaches to lifestyle. How do you eat? How do you take care of your body? How do you learn to relax? You know, how do you deal with unprocessed emotions? If you do those things, more than likely, yeah, life is going to throw you stuff. You've got genetic inheritances. You've got environmental factors. But if you take care of the very basics and understand your body at different stages, for example, how your kids handled Lyme's disease versus how you handled Lyme's disease, yeah. then what you can do is you can learn to modify things in a way that really works for you. And so I would say we've been studying these kinds of things. We started in macrobiotics. Melanie then got very involved with Ayurveda. Uh, we began to look at the Tibetan aspect of Ayurveda with one of our teachers. And um, we've really stayed in the, in the idea that you know, I mean, a lot of people want to learn the herbs and the sort of like the more elaborate aspects of all these systems, but very few people want to just try and keep it simple. And so what we've been doing is we've been focusing on the last 40 years in trying to keep it simple. Nice. That's so beautiful. Um, the body work piece is a piece that comes up a lot because in the Western mindset, body work is some luxurious thing you do at a spa maybe, you know, infrequently. It's kind of lumped it's into this idea of... Disposable income. Yes, exactly. And on an Ayurvedic model, it's a core part of the support of the body. How do you help people shift that mindset and what kind of body work should they be looking for? I, I think um, I think there's, there's two answers to that question. You know, in terms of what sort of body work should they be looking for, from, from an Ayurvedic perspective, you, you always have to use the beautiful phrase that my teacher would use every single time somebody would come up with, what do you think of this kind of thing, Dr. Ladd? And he would say clearly, well, very good, but for whom, right? Yes. So, you know, there's not, there's not a best kind of massage therapy. There's not a best kind of massage therapist. You, you know, you clearly need to... Uh, trust the practitioner that you're working with yes, yes. and have a good, uh, good, honest, workable connection. Yes. And you need to reflect yourself, are you seeing benefit in the time that, that the practitioner is giving you for that benefit to seem reasonable? Yes. In other words, why would you keep going to somebody if you don't like them and you're not getting results just because we're told that this is the thing that really is going to crack the nut for us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the other answer is, um, you know, from an Ayurvedic point of view, you really do have the responsibility to take care of yourself. And as lovely as it is to go to a spa and have somebody else rub oil into your body and lavish you with care, and work on particular knotty parts of your musculature and put you in a steam box and uh, give you a delicious cup of tea, right? You can do 99% of that for yourself Ooh. at home by just agreeing to take the time and having what you need on site, which means, you know, you find yourself a massage oil that you love the smell of, that feels great on your skin, you agree with yourself to take the time to do that with some regularity, you know, be it once a week, once a month, once a day. Um, and you, you have confidence that that kind of a routine actually is the thing that's going to help your body turn a corner. And again, if it doesn't work, then you don't continue doing it, right? You, you go and seek further help. And I, you know, I, I can't stress that point too much, Lindsay. It's like, you know, I feel like with all, so many of these things, people say, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Well, they're enthusiastic, presumably, because it's worked for them. But because it's worked for them, it doesn't inherently mean it's going to be your answer. Absolutely. I think the other important part of this is that with respect to healing or 
uh, or body work in general. Um, and Melanie was talking about, do you like your therapist? Because you can say, okay, you need to have this particular kind of deep tissue work. But there really is, um, I mean, I would think about the old version of how it would be uh, that healers uh, were, were midwives, they were shamans, they were connected to the community. There was a sense of relationship. So to me, the fact that we talk about professional people as healers in kind of an aloof and detached way, in some ways misses the point in terms of the interrelationship that needs to be there. There's a saying in Chinese medicine, it's from the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine, which is kind of like the standard for, uh, for acupuncture. And what, what it says is, if a person does not have confidence in the therapist or the therapy they are engaged in, it won't work. A very important so piece. to me what it is is um, when I think about body work I think about getting involved in a relationship with someone at a certain level but what I also tell them is in the long run my goal as a quote-unquote professional is to become redundant in your life nice and that is at some point I want to be able to empower you and teach you like Melanie was saying, when she says 90% of this, you can learn to do at home. Okay. Is that the core of the keep it simple? I think so, to, to some extent. I mean, what it, I mean, in terms of keeping it simple, it really is learning how to pay attention to your life. Yeah. And realizing when, when suddenly what happens is you're, you're beginning to live a routine and a way of being, which basically is frenetic and out of control. And then what you have to realize is, Keeping it simple can be really hard because you then you have to stop all these exotic ways of being or treating yourself and saying that what we really need is I need more glasses of wine a night because I deserve it. Right. It's like, excuse me, after a while, really probably what you need is a good bath and an enema. <laughs> you know, the, the, the idea is... The, <laughs> I'll be your client. <laughs> Um, I, I would say, you know, although we're saying keep it simple, Lindsay, there is there is absolutely nothing particularly simple about keeping it simple because we all know that when we're not well or when we're under greater stress, it's actually the simple, basic, insane things that completely fly out of our minds. You know, I I say I say very clearly to people, listen, when we're in a state of stress. We forget that food is the, is the answer for hunger. Right, right. We forget that water is the answer to thirst. And we certainly forget, especially in America, that rest, rest and deep rest and more rest is the antidote for feeling tired. Right. You know? Right. Three things fly out of the window first. And without actually, again, deciding to try and settle yourself into some kind of a basic routine to get a handle on those things, you're just going to keep flying around. Yeah. And, it, and it, nothing is really going to stick. You know, it'll stick for a short time, but it'll fly away from you because you have to get grounded in those three things. Absolutely. So what are some of the ways that you help people make that shift? Because it's, as you've said, it's no easy thing. Um, the awareness comes in first, you've mentioned. Um, reaching out, it sounds like, gaining some mentorship and some support, like the kind that you offer. Um, and then how do people begin to integrate that so they can make change in their lives, to step off that frenetic cycle and invite those three things in? Well, I think one, one of the aspects of body work in, 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 in Ayurveda and generally in body work, um, and the reason why we've seen it so important is that um, people are so spun out these days. Yeah. And so what we have found is, I mean, we used to do a lot, I used to do a lot of macrobiotic and Ayurvedic, just dietary counseling. And what we found was that the touch actually begins to ground people. If you just give them a list of things to do um, without, without some form of touch being part of it, that oftentimes they can't go out and integrate as well. So our body work has oftentimes been a gateway for people to then have a deeper conversation about what it is that they need to do. In Ayurveda, they say that the skin 
is a very large, what's called a marma point. A marma point is points to the chakra grid that acupuncture points are to the acupuncture grid. And marma points connect you to your subconscious. So when I touch somebody with intention and bring them back, make contact with their, their skin of their body, what happens is whether it's on their face or on their feet or wherever you're in terms of the different kinds of treatments, what happened is I am directing them back to themselves. And in that state, I can then talk to them about, you know, why don't you try and, you know, at this point, you know, a good example was I had a client a few weeks ago, um, tremendous amount of pain, uh, lots of surgeries. Um, and I did the body work. And then I, I just said, well, you know, some things I'd like you to consider is, um, what have you been eating lately? And I said, have you been eating a lot of tomatoes? She goes, yeah, we just had a tomato harvest. I said, well, guess what? Tomatoes make your nervous system fire faster. If you just cut out nightshades mm -hmm. for a few weeks, see where your pain level is. Mm -hmm. Let's just start there. Beautiful. It's interesting. She came back a week later and she was reporting to me. It wasn't that I was a miracle healer. It's just that one week of not having tomatoes, her pain was considerably less. Beautiful. A, a simple tweak like that and in reflection. Yeah, I love that. Um, so not only have I been the benefit of my family of your um, healing work with my child and also your community healing work, but you have created a product that has changed um, my husband's life dramatically because he is a coffee lover. And I am wondering if you would tell us a little bit about what brought that product into being and, and how people can find it. We, we were introduced, um, there's a... I, I would say one of the very first people that we met um, as, a teacher. A, as a teacher was in Brisson in the 70s. mid 70s, okay? And a fantastic, amazing, amazing healer. I mean, on, on every level. We only had very brief encounters with him. But um, as a healer, I thought he was astounding. As a, um, as a cook... I thought he was amazing. You could you could listen to this man talk about food and feel nourished. I mean, he was he was astounding. His uh, his name was Shyam Singh, and um, he had um, a formula in a very interesting book. His remedies were some of the most cathartic remedies I have ever encountered. They totally worked, but you know you basically had to be pretty tough to to follow it tough, tough or really desperate to follow what he was talking about i mean for example your your listeners probably know about different diets for candida right he had a overripe banana diet for candida okay does that go absolutely contrary to everything you've ever heard about yeah, how yeah. to get rid of candida right yeah. It shouldn't be fruit, it shouldn't be sweet, but we know that brown bananas are about as sugary as eating. Why the heck would that work? But if that guy told me to do it, I think something amazing would happen. So the second, yeah? the second part of that remedy was, though, that you had to stand in front of a mirror naked and laugh at yourself. <laughs> wow. Right. So, you know, definitely somebody that danced with the body-mind uh, connection and... Somebody who knew a heck of a lot about cooking. So he had this um, interesting formula for spices that um, he blended into his coffee. So we started this idea by thinking, oh, you know, we could become a coffee company and we could blend up spices, blah, blah, blah. And then it w we started, or we could publish, you know, share this recipe and we quickly realized that people were, were not as dedicated as we were and that they weren't going to be drinking coffee, you know, so that they had to brew two different pots, one for mom, one for dad, or they weren't going to be grinding up their own spices. And traveling with this kind of coffee with themselves all the time. So uh, we came... Uh, I, mean, I did, but that one, but yeah. I'm here. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> um, but we came across the, um, the idea of um, something called CO2 extracts, which are sort of like um, essential oils, but they're totally stable and they're not oils and they're water soluble. 
They happen to be made locally, which is even better from the point of view of, uh, of uh, green economy. And so we, we put together a, a blend of these different spice extracts and um, you just put a couple of drops in a cup of coffee. You need a tiny little bottle and that gives you 150 cups. And we were very curious to see does a CO2 extract work the same as a spice? And we think it does. We've seen you that know, it does. We, we basically feel that the CO2 extract is more than just the pure active ingredient, that it's actually broad spectrum enough to do something 